good morning to you all this morning. Yeah, oh, there we go. Just, just checking. There is someone actually here. That's good. Um, look, just one brief announcement, but but an exciting one. Um, Nick and Jess Bembo uh, have had their baby girl, um, Audrey Hazel, on um, Christmas Eve, eleven o'clock. I think in the morning, eleven o'clock. So, and they're, they're both doing really, really well. So we praise God for that. That's really exciting. Um, no doubt Narell will be very excited. So congrats to Narell and all the family. I think that's the first grandchild for Narell. So she's been like, so and don't worry, Narell. We get it. We understand. Um, I'm going to call you to worship. If you're a visitor, though, and you're a bit unfamiliar, uh, out through those doors, you'll find the cry room and the toilets. After church service, we'll have a, a morning tea. So feel free to hang around for that. I'm going to call you to worship from Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Um, here's Paul. He's writing to a, a, a church off in Ephesus, which is in um, just near Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And he's talking about, it's, it's actually one big long sentence in the original language, but he's talking about how God is good and how God sent his son into the world to save us so that we would come to know him and that praise should be the result. And he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of of his glorious grace. Amen. Well, we're going to pray and uh, we're going to seek God's blessing upon us this morning. Let's humble ourselves in prayer. Father, we, we pray because we believe that uh, you rule and reign over all that is seen and unseen. Uh, we pray because we believe your word, that the gospel promises that you have loved us in your son, that you hear us when we pray and that you are quick to forgive our sins and bless us with your presence and with wisdom and with grace and with strength, that we, that we might live lives which are a blessing uh, to our neighbour and which honour our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we gather here this morning, we would pray for that gospel grace uh, to work in each of our lives. It's often hard, the day after Christmas, with so much moving around and celebrating and eating and drinking, uh, there is a sort of a, a lethargy that can come over us. And some will come this morning uh, really excited. Some will be really tired. Others will be really uh, distracted. Uh, some will probably rather be elsewhere. And so, Father, yet we would pray that because of your sovereign mercies in Christ, that you would work in each of our hearts, that we might look to Christ and in him find hope and forgiveness and grace and strength. So that the words that we sing and the words which we hear, that they might resonate in our hearts as true. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, sing our first song of praise this morning. Come praise and glorify, which is sort of an outworking of Ephesians chapter 1.
Is everyone feeling bright? Had a good sleep? We had a massive party at our house yesterday, and the house looks like an absolute wreck. The, there's bottles everywhere and wrappers, um, discarded presents. Uh, there's food in the carpet. Uh, does your house look like that? Sticky door handles, candy canes. Did anybody else have a party yesterday? No? You did? Whose party was it? Whose birthday party was it? You know whose birthday party it was? Ethan? Whose party was it? Jesus' party. Birthday party? That's right. And that's why we all um, celebrated and had a good time together because of the birth of Jesus. Yeah? <laughs> all right. That sounds great. Um, okay, so um, let's do a couple of random catechism questions just to see if you're all ready to go. Um, how can we glorify God? Does anybody know? Exactly, by loving God, keeping his commandments, that's how we can glorify God. Um, Mr. Gray taught us yesterday about, um, I'm not sure what it was about exactly, but he taught us about sanctification. And that is a big word, but he taught us about how sinners, how God makes us holy, um, in heart so that our con conduct is glorifying to him. So do you remember what conduct is? Remember we had the behavior of the knights and the knights had to do what? Yep. Exactly. So the, our conduct is our behavior. So we need God to work in our hearts so that our behavior is glorifying to him. Um, and we had that great example with the castle in the box. Um, and we're almost late for Christmas dinner because of that. It went for a long time. Anyway, so today we're up to question 50. Uh, for whom did Christ obey and suffer? Has anybody learnt the answer? For whom did Christ obey and suffer? Anybody got any ideas? Elsa, did you learn it on the way in the car? That's good. Loenis said this morning that, Mum, can we learn it in the car? Because then we've got less time to forget it. <laughs> so did you learn it, Loenis? Do you want to come and read it out for us? Come on. You come and read it, honey. Come, on. come and read it out. <laughs> do you have to read it, or can you do it without? Well. Okay. It's a nice loud voice in here. Class of Christ obeyed and suffered for those who the Father had given him. That's right. A good way to remember Jesus, I find, is 
to remember that he is a shepherd. And if we look in the gospel, Jesus' own words here in the gospel, he says that all, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And he explains that he is the shepherd of his sheep. Um, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. Um, I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So he saves and protects us and he was obedient unto death um, and laid down his life for us that we would have life. And the way that we know that we are God's people, uh, if we hear if we hear God's word. So Jesus says again, "My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me." Um, and just quickly, I was going to, I was thinking this morning, when 25 years ago, when I was 10 years old, uh, my uncle had a sheep farm, and we would, my sister and I would get dropped off in the school holidays uh, by our parents with my uncle, and we would be there for the whole school holidays, and we would have to do shepherding. And shepherding for us was riding around on a motorbike, and we didn't have ATVs or roll bars or four-wheel bikes. We had three-wheel motorbikes. The motorbike only had three wheels, and it had no brakes. So my uncle, I don't know if he really loved us or not, but he used to send us out for a whole day riding around the paddocks on a three-wheel motorbike. And it used to roll over, and it used to do all sorts of things. It used to run over your leg if you put your leg out. It was pretty pretty fun, but we survived. But that was shepherding, because we had to go and check all the sheep, because they were sheep are stupid, and they're always dying. If you don't look after them, they, they get through fences, and they eat too much food and die. Or... They get attacked by flies and they die. Or they have a baby and they can't get up again. Or they run out of water. So you always have to chase them around checking that they're okay. Um, And we can think of ourselves like that because Jesus is our good shepherd. Um, He died for us. And we need to, uh, he needs to make us holy in our hearts so that our behavior is honoring to him. Um, but we can give thanks that he obeyed for us and that the Father, God the Father, has given us to him and we know that we are his when we listen to his word. You understand? Cool. I'm going to pray for you and then we're going to sing a children's song. Father God in heaven, thank you that we can bow our heads before you and know that you are a great and mighty God that sent uh, the gift of your son Jesus. Uh, that he was born at Christmas time and that he lived and was put to death but rose again for our sins. Um, We thank you, Lord, for these children. We pray particularly that they would be listening to your word, that it would talk to them in their hearts and that they would be followers of Christ. Father, we pray that your blessing upon us and our church and we thank you for the news of a new baby um, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The kids... Wait here, and we're going to sing little by little with no actions.
great singing, kids. It's good to see you all this morning. I'm going to bring us God's word from Acts chapter 2 this morning. Uh, I'm reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 29 to 41. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up and of that we are all our witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptised, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Thanks, Matt. So just by way of context, um, we spent about four weeks or so just trying to trace through, so rather than just landing at Christmas and having those birth narratives, we try to actually put a context around the birth narrative so that when you see Christmas and you try to understand the birth of this child, you understand it in its historical context as the Jewish people of the day would have and certainly the Gentiles that followed. And so uh, we're going to continue that today. Uh, We're going to look at uh, Acts chapter 2, which is the first Christian sermon. Uh, This is Peter trying to explain to the Jews and to the Gentiles that all gathered that day, and there were thousands of them, what had gone on uh, previously. And so hopefully with God's grace, uh, we'll also understand. And just like them, hopefully we'll respond with hearts that look to the Lord in faith. So I'm going to pray, ask for God's blessing upon us, and then we'll hear from his word. Our Father, we're thankful that we can have a confidence that your word is true. We have built our lives upon that solid rock of your son, Jesus Christ, and his word, which is um, sharper than any double-edged sword. And so we would pray that by the power of your spirit, the sword might be wielded even now. We pray for (coughs) each one of us that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and minds that understand so that we might worship you uh, as an appropriate response to your gospel grace. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the really helpful things in the age of streaming media, or one of the, I think, at least helpful, um, is recaps. Recaps are so important now. So let's just say you've been watching a, a season of a show on streaming media. Maybe it was Bosch or or The Last Kingdom, or Line of Duty. And, you know, you've really enjoyed it. Uh, great series, and you're sort of hanging for the next series. And then finally, it drops. It might be six months later, or a year later, but finally it drops. And at least at my age, recaps are actually really helpful. You know, you get the voiceover at when the recap starts, and it says, previously, in The Last Kingdom. And then it sort of unpacks and gives you a summary of everything that's happened in the series so that you can sort of go, oh, yeah, I get who that person is and what's happening there. Well, that's what I'm going to do, and that's actually what Peter did in his first sermon. As Peter's 
sermon drops, I want to give you a recap of the Old Testament, sort of like you might hear if you were watching Netflix. So when it says so I'm doing that, you can all just mentally have an image in your mind of a voiceover saying, previously in the Bible. Right? And that'll give you an understanding of what's happened in Acts chapter 2. So season 1 started, and God created the world in six days. It was good. But what wasn't good was Adam and Eve, and they were duped by a snake, and evil slithered into every home and every heart. And yet God promised in season one that that he'd send a saviour, the seed of a woman. In season two, God chooses a bloke named Abraham, and he makes him these promises. Abraham, you follow me. I'm going to make your name great. And he promised him family. He promised him land and he promised that through him and his people that they would be a blessing to the whole world in season three god fulfills his promises to abraham has a grandson jacob whose name is later changed to israel and his family becomes so numerous so large that they were actually called the house of jacob It wasn't without a few dramas, but the house of Jacob eventually entered into and possessed the promised land. In season four, the house of Jacob wanted to be like all the other nations around them. They asked God, give us a king like the Philistine king. And it's not that God was against kings. He just knew their motives were all messed up. Yet, despite all that, God did give them a king, and he gave them a good king. He gave them King David. Now, David loved God, and he wanted to build God a glorious house of worship. And God said, you've got to be kidding. I'm going to build you a house. And he promised David that he would build a house for David, which would be an everlasting kingdom. And he said to him, a son of yours will sit on his throne forever. Well, in season five, we followed all David's sons. And a few of them showed promise. I mean, Solomon started well. But pretty much all of David's sons all messed up. And God had said to them, if you love me, a bit like what Vaughan was just saying to the kids, if you love me, you'll walk in my ways. And if you walk in my ways, I will cause my shalom, that's a Hebrew word for sort of meaning like peace or prosperity, I will cause my shalom to flood the kingdom. Except none of the kings walked in his ways. And none of the kings kept covenant with God. And yet despite all of God's patience, the house of Jacob continued to do all bad stuff and it continued to do it all the time. And God had warned them What would be the outcome? And so when you get to the end of season five, it's ominous. And season six, that was the worst season. That that was an awful season. None of the characters were easy to like. They were all dodgy. And I know it sounds sort of terrible, but you sort of wanted them to die. You found yourself sort of screaming at the TV, someone, please, put an end to all this evil. That was such a sad, horrible season. Death, destruction, depression, and then that was followed by decades, 70 years of exile. In fact, when season seven came on, you were sort of wondering, am I even going to keep watching? Am I even going to hang in for the rest of this series? It was... It was still bleak in season seven, even after the exile. A real lack of heroes, apart from maybe Ezra and Nehemiah. And the characters were all different, but to be honest, the plot line pretty much sounds the same. And you're sort of, you're just longing for a hero, for the character to come who is going to finally fix things. And then we get to season seven. That was a cracker. (laughs) That was the best season. That was the Christmas season. Finally, finally, the seed of the woman arrives. The house of Jacob has the hope of redemption. 
And finally, the throne of David has a king who's actually going to be worthy. And finally, at last, because the king is worthy, the shalom of the kingdom gets offered to everyone. And just when you're getting excited, just when you're saying this is a cracker of a season, outrageously, as in it almost broke the internet, the crowds reject him. His friends abandon him. And then finally the Romans kill him. And despite the fact that some of us emptied boxes of tissues and ate comfort food for three whole days, it wasn't long before we realised that that wasn't the end because the grave couldn't actually hold him. And we had three episodes of absolute joy and bliss as the resurrected Jesus met with family and friends, was seen by thousands of witnesses before his ascension. <laughs> Such a cool way to finish the season as he went up into the sky. And then finally, season eight drops. And that's exactly where we are. We're in season eight, Acts chapter two. And the bumbling disciples are now the fearless prophets, the fearless apostles. And here is Peter as he, he starts his sermon. And just like I started mine, he starts with a recap. Except he doesn't do seasons one through to three because he knows they've already seen all that. And he gives his understanding of seasons four to seven in verses 16 to 28. And he recaps how Israel had rejected God and had broken covenant, how the kings had all led the nation astray. And he gets to verse 29, which Matt read to us, and he says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that is King David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us this day. In other words, he's saying, you know, David was great. He was perhaps, along with Josiah, the greatest of all Israel's kings. But David is dead. And the grave held him. But he said, you know, David wasn't just a king. He was also a prophet. Verse 30 he says, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And Peter was saying, you know, remember that promise to David that the house of Jacob, that is God's people, Israel, that they would have a descendant on a throne on the house of David. And he says, David foresaw that that wasn't his grandson or his great-grandson. It certainly wasn't his son Solomon. David knew that. In fact, he says, David foresaw that it would be the seed of the woman, it would be Jesus the Christ who would be the one who sat on the throne. He would be the one who would inherit the kingdom. And it's not a physical kingdom that is limited in time and space, but it is an eternal kingdom that would bring blessings and shalom that would flow to all the nations. You see, David knew at the very heart of God's promise, this fundamental covenant relationship, that I will be your God and you will be my people. And, and to be God's people, to be the house of Jacob, it has always meant the same thing, to do God's will, to follow him. That's what Abraham did. Remember how it all starts with Abraham. Abraham's this really wealthy, impressive fellow whose business is going gangbusters in Ur of the Chaldeans, and God says, come follow me. And he does. And he doesn't even know where he's going to go. Abraham, he was to do God's will. And if you think of all of God's servants, Moses was to do God's will. Israel, through her kings, were to do God's will why? That they might be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And what we know is that in varying degrees, all the kings failed to rule Israel in justice and righteousness. And therefore the house of Jacob, that is God's people, failed in her calling to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
And instead of um, the shalom or the blessings of the covenant coming to Israel, the curses do. In fact, if you know your Old Testament well, there's, there's about 17 times in 1 and 2 Kings and Chronicles where it specifically says of the kings of Israel, they made Israel to be sin. Not that they made Israel sin, they made them to be sin because of the covenant breaking. And see, Peter said, David saw this, he understood this, and he understood that a time would come when the throne of the house of David would be fulfilled by this chosen one, this Messiah, and that he would rule over God's people, the house of Jacob, in justice and righteousness, and that would bring in an age of peace, peace between God and peace between men and women. And it's not just David who foresaw this. Every Christmas we read from Isaiah 9 because the prophet Isaiah saw it. Of the increase of his government, peace, shalom, it says, there's going to be no end. On the throne of David and of his kingdom, he will establish and uphold it with what? Justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And the Lord of hosts, he will do this. And then what Peter does is he drops the bombshell and he says, Jesus is the one. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. He is David's greatest son. He is the true seed of the woman. He is the true house of Jacob who does the will of God. He is the promised king who rules with justice and righteousness. The promised Messiah who will bring in an age of shalom or blessings that will flow to male and female, to Jew and to Gentile, to rich and to poor and to slave and to free. He's the true son of David who actually inherits the throne of the house of David. And he does that through his obedience, through his righteousness, that he lives that perfect life on behalf of his people. And the evidence and proof of that, the grave doesn't hold him. The, the grave has no claim on him. The grave only has claim on those who sin. And Peter says, David foresaw all these things, including the resurrection and his ascension. Look at verses 32 to 33. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit is poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. This risen Jesus, we all saw him, he's saying. You all saw him. He, he appeared before thousands in Jerusalem. And he is the one that we waited on on all the ages. And he's the one who will redeem the house of Jacob and rules on the throne of David. And now, he says, he's even at the right hand of the Father, exalted waiting for that day when that last trumpet sounds and all will be revealed. I don't know, you ever have one of those phone calls from a friend or a family member, a grandson or granddaughter, your own kids? They start a conversation you know, and you know it's, it's a little bit clunky, it's a little bit weird and they start just giving you random bits of information. Um, uh, had an accident. Oh, I hope you're okay. Well, that's how I would answer. I hope you're okay. Yeah, yeah oh, I'm fine, fine. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't have a lot of hours at work at the moment. Oh, great. Underemployed. Good. Good. Oh, well, that's, well, we'll pray for you. Um, think, things are a bit tight at the moment. And you sort of, what? what I don't really need to know all these details, these random details, but you know you've been giving all these random details, all these little um, dots, and you're supposed to join them, dots together. So when the, it's, it's not supposed to be a bombshell when they finally say, well, come on, offer to fix my car or to give me some money or to whatever, but they want you to join the dots. and Well, that's what's happening here. He's laid it all out. All the dots are there. you just got to join them together. P Peter does. 
Verse 36. That's the bombshell. If you haven't pieced it together, Peter pieces it together for you. Verse 36. Let all of the house of Israel, could have said the house of Jacob, same thing. Let the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. It's, that, that's the first thing. That's what he says. You don't make Jesus Lord. Jesus is Lord. Sometimes you hear in Christian circles, church circles, you know, you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And I know it's said with really good intentions, but it actually fails to understand the sweep of the Bible. No one makes Jesus Lord. Jesus is the Lord. The only question is, is whether you recognize it or not. The only question is whether you'll bow your knee before him or not. And, and, and that's just a matter of time anyway, because the day will come when he returns and everybody will bow their knee and confess with their tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. You, you, no one can make Jesus Lord. No one. You simply recognize that he actually is Lord. That, that's what Peter's saying. All the house of Jacob, the house of Israel, what you need to know is this one whom you crucified. The Father has made him Lord and Christ. Isn't that what, you know, what Thomas, when he first saw him after the resurrection, it's the first thing he said, my Lord and my God. That's why Peter says, be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Later in Acts 10, Peter declares that Jesus is, in fact, Lord of all. And Paul says in Romans 10, verse 9, when he, he's banged out the gospel, when he says, well, then what should we do in response to the gospel? He says, well, do this. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not might be saved, you will be saved. Jesus is Lord. That's the bombshell. That's the take home. That's joining all the dots together at the gospel. Becoming a follower of Jesus is actually recognizing and submitting to that lordship. And the idea being that while we're saved by faith, our faith then submits to the Lord and follows him. That's why all the people ask Peter, then what shall we do? And Peter responds, repent and be baptized into Christ by the Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. And so we're told in the text that about 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. And as we get it here this morning, I, you know, I don't, I don't know whether you're part of the house of Jacob under the rule of the one who sits on the throne of the house of David. But I was thinking about it, I, I'm pretty sure I know why people don't. I, I'm pretty sure I've got a pretty good idea why most Australians are not part of the house of Jacob. Because they don't want to be part of the house of David. In other words, they, they don't mind the idea of forgiveness. I mean, let's be honest, who, who, who doesn't want to be forgiven of all their sin and shame? Who, who doesn't want their anger or their greed or their lies or perhaps their immorality buried forever, forever? Who, who, who wouldn't want a, uh, their conscience calmed or their fears comforted or their soul saved? Who doesn't want the hidden sins never to haunt them or their reckless words never to condemn them? And then if you think about the undeniability of all of our moral failures and the inevitability that we will all die and face judgment, it actually should be a no-brainer. <laughs> it should be a no-brainer. Like, who wouldn't become a Christian? Who wouldn't take God's offer of forgiveness? It seems like a no-brainer. But the trouble is, to be part of the house of Jacob, that is to be part of the forgiven, have your sins forgiven amongst God's people, you also have to be part of the house of David. 
You can't be part of the house of Jacob without being part of the house of David. If you want a saviour, you also get a lord. The, the difficulty is some people are okay with the idea of having my sins forgiven. I just don't want a lord. I don't want to follow. I don't want to submit. And that's the part that people stumble over. I'm okay with Redeemer Jesus, who saves me from my sins. I just don't want King Jesus, who rules over my life. It's why many will enter church, but not heaven. Many will embrace Christmas, but not Christ, and certainly not eternal life. Because of the heart of sin, is this sort of human desire that we want to be king. We want to be a ruler. We, 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 want, we don't want to be accountable to anyone, especially God. We often think of sin as... as the breaking of laws, and there's truth to that. You know, so we lie or we steal or we're greedy or we're arrogant or we're proud. But that's just the fruit of sin. It's just the fruit of sin. The root of sin and the very heart of sin is that we want to be like God. We want to be in control. We want to answer to no one, give an account to no one. No one will judge me. And I will live for myself and for my own glory. And sure, people dress it up with rebellion in a whole manner of ways. And some arrange moral reasons against Christianity. Some arrange intellectual reasons. Some even bring charges against God. But when you draw the curtain back on all those reasons, you'll find at the very heart of that is this reluctance to recognize that Christ is Lord and to rule someone's life. And just like the Jews and the Romans who crucified him, Peter says, yet let all of Israel, let the house of Israel, let the house of Jacob therefore know for certain that the Father, God, has made him both Lord and Christ, the one whom you crucified. And so this morning, if, you're, if you are... If you are to be in the house of Jacob, that is God's people, then it's because you recognize the house of David, that you come under Christ as Lord. You cannot have a saviour without a Lord. You just can't. That's not the gospel message. That's not the Christian truth. If you want to be forgiven and loved by God, you must love God yourself. And you must love God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength as his grace would enable you. And that means following. And you won't do that perfectly. No one ever does. That's why we need forgiveness. But I'm telling you that it is a banged up uh, misapplication of the gospel to think that I can claim the forgiveness but somehow reject Christ as the Lord of my life. That's a great reminder for all you young people. You want to follow Jesus, then he will be the Lord of your life and your life ought to be shaped by his word, by his commands, by his example. Your priorities have to be shaped by that. And if you're not a believer, then rather than doubling down, rather than hoping it's not true, rather than rolling your dice and saying, well, let's find out when I die, you do what Peter told the crowds who crucified Jesus. You do what Paul told the Romans, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him dead, you will be saved. That's the gospel promise. You will be saved. Oh, but God would give you that grace now that you would confess Christ as Lord and be saved this very hour. Let's pray. Father, we know that we cannot be truly part of the house of Jacob without being part of the house of David. To submit and to recognize the rightful rule of Jesus over our lives. That he would show us the way of how we ought to walk and how we ought to think. How we ought to love rather than pursuing our own personal gain and pride. But rather, Lord, that we might live lives as servants of the king loving neighbour and self uh, and yourself so that we might honour you. W would you give us the grace to do that? Would you give us the grace that, that, that we might hear your words, not harden our hearts, but rather that we might respond 
recognizing your grace and love and your son and that we might receive Christ as he really is, as Lord. And know those eternal blessings, that shalom of your kingdom, that our sins, that they have been buried with him and our shame has been taken far from us and that we can have this confidence that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So hear our prayer, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to respond uh, in song first, uh, a song which recounts the gospel in a way, uh, in the, these very words. So we're going to sing together Jerusalem. As we do that, we'll also take up a free will offering. Um, but if you're a visitor or a guest, please just let the offering bags go past. It's an act of worship for the Lord's people. Let's stand and we'll sing together. Uh, a song of response, Jerusalem.
going to invite our elder Daniel to come and lead us in prayer. <laughs> Thanks. Someone will pray. Uh, <laughs> let's bow our heads together in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you that uh, we can come to you, the covenant-making, the covenant-keeping God, uh, the one whose hand we see at work in history, and as we've surveyed that history this morning and been reminded of how you have worked over thousands of years to bring about your good purposes, uh, your grace upon us, upon the world, we recognise that to you alone we must pray, for there is no one else to whom we could come. But Father, we thank you too that we are not just uh, spectators of your grace, those who would watch from afar as you work your will throughout history, but we are in fact participants. More than that, we are the recipients of your love and your grace. And so we are humbled. We recognise that in our sinful hearts we seek by pride to to raise ourselves up, to retain some sense of autonomy. But in the light of your word this morning, we are reminded of the only way to come to you is through humility. And so we humble ourselves. We don't ask our prayers this morning that you might bless what we want to do. We don't come to you to tell you what needs to be done. We humbly ask that you would give us eyes to see your way that you would give us faith that we might ask according to your will. And in that we have confidence it will be done. So even help us as we pray. Father, as a community of believers this morning, we celebrate the gift of new life. And we thank you that Jess has given birth to Audrey and we welcome that life amongst us. We thank you uh, for that gift and pray that you would continue to bless both mother and child. And be with Nick too as he uh, takes uh, the, the head of the home responsibilities and as he offers support to Jess. Uh, we pray that you would bless them as a family and help them to grow in your grace. Father, we are mindful that there have been a number of births in, the, uh, in this congregation over the uh, last while. And, and still yet, um, Laura, to give birth, and we pray that you'll be with her as she carries child and that you'll bless her with good health, and with Nick too as they prepare uh, for the years of parenting to follow. Uh, Father, we do pray for all our new parents, for in fact all our parents. It is a difficult thing to parent children, to raise them in the, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, uh, to set a good example. Uh, Father... Children don't come with an instruction book and every one of them is different and so it remains a challenge and there are stresses and pressures uh, and, and so often as parents we feel alone not knowing what to do with this life that you have granted us. Father, we pray that you would guide and strengthen our parents, that they might parent well, uh, that as uh, we submit ourselves to your word, you would show us uh, good and godly principles in which to guide young lives towards a heavenly home. Father, we pray that you would help us as a congregation to unite together in that cause. Uh, you have given to us the gift of the gospel to share with one another. That includes amongst ourselves that we might enjoy its benefits and its blessings, but that we might guide others amongst us towards Jesus Christ and to him alone. And Father, as we think uh, of that new life, that rebirth that you offer to all mankind, uh, through Jesus Christ, we pray that you would help us to handle the gospel well, not only in our congregation as we think of our outreach uh, works, uh, our uh, meetings that we have from time to time to nourish one another and build one another up in the faith also. Uh, and I guess to that end, we ask for the refreshing and renewing of our leaders as they take a break at the moment and look forward to 2022. Uh, but it is an awesome responsibility to handle that gospel well, and so we pray that you would be with them and strengthen them at this time. Uh, but we broaden our minds to think of how that works in the community. You have ordained uh, the church. You have ordained that your word would go forth through uh, people like us, people who are sinners saved by grace, people who are weak uh, in and of themselves. And so we handle a wonderful eternal truth and we seek to present it to the world. Help us in that task. Uh, we think of other churches who are like us, like-minded, that we, those who accept Jesus Christ alone 
as the way of salvation. And we pray that you would help the gospel to go forth in our nation and indeed around the world, that there would be a clear message, especially at this time, being Christmas, uh, especially in our season, in our generation, as we see a drifting away from the things of God and from our Christian heritage and a, an increasing acceleration towards godlessness, towards calling those things that are evil as if they were good. And it breaks our hearts. Father, help us to be the gospel voice in our culture, that we might call our society back to the ways of God, that we might honour you in the way that we live, in the words we speak, in how we interact with authorities, in how we influence and, uh, our governing authorities. Father, there is much that we can do, but there's so much we can't do. And so we ask you to be guiding our leaders, that they might make good and wise decisions, that they might promote justice and godliness, whether they're convicted of heart or not, that they would find themselves being your servants, doing your will for the good of all people. Father, we would pray particularly for the churches in our area and we think of the Ballerine and are mindful that they are losing their property, their place of worship, and we ask that you guide them as they search for a new place, uh, that they would make an easy transition. We know that you work things out according to your timing, but that doesn't stop us from becoming stressed when things are getting tight. And we pray that you would grant them a peace and that there would be a, a way forward and you would aid them in their their search for a new place of worship. We think of Geelong West and we think of what a uh, key area that is to work in, in amongst the cafe culture in Packington Street. And they have uh, their new property now and, and an opportunity to, to reach out into the community uh, in a way that none of our other congregations do. And so we pray that you would help them to have a spirit of unity, that you would bind them together, uh, that they would show love one to the other and be gracious, and in so doing, declare the love of Jesus Christ to those around. Father, we think of Bannockburn, and we give you thanks. We have a close connection with them, uh, and we pray that you would be with Matt and the elders out there uh, as they seek to work in a very active and growing community in the Bannockburn region, and we pray that you would guide them in how best to connect and to communicate and draw people in that they might hear the gospel. And we pray for the Lee as well. And we give you great thanks for the uh, growth already seen and for Surrenderer and the work that he's doing there. And we pray that you would strengthen them as they reach out into the rural communities. Uh, and Father, we are mindful that in, in rural Australia, we're a big nation and so many of our churches are along the coastal regions and in cities, but the rural areas need a witness as well. And so many churches are closing down and they, they're so small and their resources are so limited. Father, we would pray for them. We ask for an outpouring of your spirit in the outback communities, that you would raise up people gifted and, and able to speak the gospel, to live the gospel, to share the gospel. And we ask for uh, mission-minded ministers to head into those areas uh, that you might equip your people for acts of service. Father, this is a time, a holiday period, and, and we know people are travelling, and so we would ask too that you would be gracious uh, for uh, granting safety on the roads, that people might arrive at their destinations, that they might uh, find in this holiday period that they are refreshed uh, and able to come back and, and re-engage in work and, and active service in the community. Uh, as we look to 2022, we have no idea what the future holds for us, but we do know that you are the God of history. We see your hand through all of history, and so we know that we can trust ourselves into your good purposes. Father, all of these prayers we bring to you, uh, there are many unspoken prayers which we know by faith that you hear and you answer, for we ask them all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing now of God's amazing grace. Amazing. 
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen.